wait a couple more minutes uh, in the room at ARB to let a few more people um, trickle in um, and, and for people to get onto the webinar. Um, so we'll be getting started in a couple of minutes. Uh, so just ask for your patience. Um, thank you. Attendees? Yeah. We have 14 people online. I don't know what this little thing means here. Not attentive? What does that mean? There's a little warning thing right here. Hmm. Oh, Jean's online. <coughs> Sarah. So just as a quick check, can people hear us on the webinar? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good to know. <laughs> and everybody can see, people can see the slides. There's a slide up right now, a title slide. Is everybody unmuted still? No, no, I've I, I, I remuted them. I'll, oh. I'll take it off just briefly, and then we can do that. And... Okay. All right, so right now you should be seeing the title slide, um, and I think we're just going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so first of all, thank you, everybody, for, for attending, either in person or on the webinar. Um, as you saw in the actual announcement, uh, there's two parts to this webinar. The morning is to cover some basics about GIS, just so um, we, in recognition that we have a wide audience and we want to make sure everybody's kind of got a basic understanding of a number of features that you have to find and um, be aware of uh, when you're doing GIS analysis and some basic considerations for the particular analysis we did. So that will be this morning, roughly hour and a half session, and then in the afternoon we'll actually talk about what we did for our analysis. In, uh, the, in the CHIP model and for the AB8 report. Um, it's meant to really be kind of a, a little bit of a public vetting process and allow everybody to see under the hood what all the assumptions were that we made, how we did the process, and to you know, give you time to then think about it, maybe get back to us at a later date on, on, on your thoughts or comments, um, and uh, go from there. We do, we do look at this tool as an evolving tool and a developing tool to meet the needs of of the um, of the industry as it as it evolves. Do we want to mention uh, Andrew? Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. um, so we're going to try to uh, moderate the questions a little bit. We will try to get to all the questions we can. Um, however, what we're going to ask um, is we're going to mute everybody for most of the presentation. But there are breaks break points in the in the throughout the presentations and. Uh, once we get a good amount of questions, we'll go ahead and try to answer as many of those as we can, and then take questions at the end as well. So uh, just please be patient with us, especially in the afternoon session. It's quite a long session, a lot of material to cover. So we're hoping to get to it um, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. Scott, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so for this primer, um, it's really intended as a brief overview of the GIS-related concepts that are really important to many of the aspects of the formulation of a tool. Um, we're going to quickly reintroduce why we're doing this, what is the motivation for, in terms of AB8, our review pro and our analysis process. Uh, we'll discuss some of the fundamentals of GIS, um, the tools that are built into ArcGIS that we utilize, and then the tools that we actually generate ourselves to be able to complete this process. And then we'll talk about some um, features and attributes of the major data sets that we utilize in our analysis, uh, just to introduce what these data sets are, what they contain, what they look like. Um, 
And so this primer will help answer questions like, what are some of the major tools from ArcGIS that we utilize? What do, what do they do? Uh, what are the differences in the spatial structure of the data sources? And how do we reconcile that? Um, how does ArcGIS assess spatial distribution of data? What statistical analyses were utilized? And how do you even make a, a tool like the uh, California Hydrogen Infrastructure Tool in something like ArcGIS? So introduction and review of CHIT. As um, most of you or all of you are probably aware, AB8 uh, requires ARB annually to assess the, uh, the plans for fuel cell electric vehicle launches and also to assess the hydrogen infrastructure and to try to determine where there is a need for new hydrogen infrastructure based on plans and uh, projections for where vehicles will be going in the future. And so we accomplished this with two different tools, CHIT and CHAT. CHAT was actually developed last year and used in the 2014 AB8 report. Um, that is essentially a database tool to help us keep track of responses to the annual surveys to the OEMs. So that's our way of getting information about what the OEM plans are for uh, vehicle launches in the future. Then CHIT takes some of that information but also does an assessment of the market, looking at market indicators where the likely first adopters might be and compares it to an estimate of coverage provided by the existing station. And so what CHIT does is it performs essentially a gap analysis. It looks at where's the market, where's the coverage, where are they not matching and prioritizes where new stations need to go based on that match or mismatch. And then as you've seen, this information was also discussed and, and made its way into the solicitation uh, concepts paper from the CEC. Um, we presented previously about this actually in a workshop for CEC. And um, today's webinar actually is, is part of that effort or, or related to that effort. So for CHIT, the, the main goal is to provide a planning tool to provide general direction for where there's needed infrastructure. It's a relative evaluation. So really what we're looking for is we want to find where are the hot spots essentially, where are these, these areas that really have a mismatch between the uh, existing coverage and the market. And so uh, just as a small example here, on the bottom you have two different cities. They have two different sized markets. They both have some stations that provide a certain degree of uh, coverage within their market. And even though the coverage provided in City A is a larger coverage than the coverage provided in City B, there might still be a greater need in that city because its market is also much larger. And so this is the kind of analysis that the CHIT performs across the entire state. Is it looks for, oh, we, you probably want to put a station in City A as a higher priority than a station in City B because there's more of an unmet market there. So um, fundamentals of GIS. Uh, this is probably the most basic we'll talk about today. So um, I'm sure some of you online or in the room at least are familiar with a, with a lot of this. But geospatial data can be conceptualized as objects that are stored, they're analyzed, edited, or transformed. And these objects have two important features. They have geometry and they have attributes. So your geometry is essentially, is it a point? Is it a polygon? Is it a line? Where is it? How is it oriented? How large is it? What is the resolution that you have on that information? And so at the bottom here, we have some examples. So we have, for example, stations around the Bay Area. The, as those are examples of points data. The streets in San Francisco is line data. Polygons can store information about, say, your county. The, the geometry itself may or may does not really actually contain the attributes then. So you might have data sets that have geometry, but then also have attributes, information about those features. So these are data fields like temperature reading at a weather station or traffic volumes on a stretch of road, or population within a county, population density. Um, not all data sources are equivalently rich and detailed in geometry and attributes. Some might have really good geometry and have no attributes. Some might have really good attributes, but not a very real-to-life geometry. And so these are issues that you have to weigh when you're looking at the possibility of utilizing multiple different data sets. Um, and you are 
probably not likely to find a ready-made data source with all the reacquired aspects for any given project. So uh, there's always some assessment that goes into weighing the pros and cons of any, any data set. And so here on the bottom, you can see how you, know, you can visualize these, these differences in these attributes. You know, higher values are a brighter color, more red color. The lower values are a blue color. You can see how, relatively speaking, and there's a difference in spatial distribution of these different attributes. So when you're working with geospatial data, it's important to remain aware that the data that you have for the geometry and the attributes um, have to be uh, logical choices for the data analysis you want to perform, for the goals that you want to uh, get to. Uh, essentially, your, your, the aim of your project really needs to be directing what data source you're utilizing. It's also important to remember, however, that even the most detailed geospatial data is actually a representation or a model of the real world. It can be fairly accurate, it can be very accurate, but it's still a representation. There's going to be some uh, built-in error before any analysis is even done. But in addition, um, because it's a representation or a model of the real world, you can then represent the real world in many different ways. So over here on the right, we're looking at San Francisco, and these are three different representations or models three different geospatial data sets of how to interpret San Francisco or how to consider San Francisco. You might have fully detailed information about everything in the city, the, the um, parcels and the streets and what the parcels are used for, or you may only be interested in elevation or just the street data. So it's important to make sure that you're choosing the right data for your project um, and that you are constantly monitoring data quality, especially as you transform the data. Um, it, since it is a model of the real world, and then you, as the more processes you essentially perform on that model, the more you're deviating again, and you just want to constantly make sure that you're, you're, you're keeping track of that data quality. One issue in that data quality that comes up with GIS, and a, the fundamental issue of GIS, is, is normalization and how to represent data. So if this is a conceptual exercise, but let's say you have a region with these three different sub-regions, and you're interested in tracking some particular population that has some characteristics, and they're distributed amongst these three regions, but there's other population as well within each of those. Well, how do you consider which region is maybe a greater target for that population? Do you just consider each of these regions independent of the size of the region? Do you consider each of these regions in, uh, for the total the target population as a proportion of the total. Uh, do you normalize to both? Uh, so if we look at this, for example, if we don't consider the size of the different areas and we're looking at this red, these red dots, we would say that each of these areas are equivalent to each other. They all have one red dot in them. But that may not actually be the representation we're looking for. We actually want to find maybe some concentration of these red dots. So for example, if we look at population-based concentration. So in the top two, two uh, areas, you know, the red dots are one half of the total population in each, whereas in the bottom, that one red dot is only a fifth of the total population. So you might say that's a, it's a lower pop target population density. Or you might look at normalizing by the size of the containing area. So each of these areas only has one red dot, but that smallest area, that's a higher concentration for that area. This is actually very important for GIS because you will have different data sets often that have different scales for different geometries. And so you do not want to be misled by a large count of your target population simply because it's in a larger area, if, especially if you're looking for concentrations of certain features and certain attributes. Or you could do both. Um, you could look at normalizing by both area and the, the total population. I'm not going to step through it, but for people who are interested, uh, this might be an exercise just stepping through those four different options, looking at these examples, and you know, just going through the thought exercise, it's kind of enlightening to see how you know, just the numbers can have a, a pretty major effect on your interpretation then of the data. And so since we are not only representing data, but we're also analyzing it, we want to make sure that we're utilizing the interpretation that's most appropriate. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this is 
fundamental to GIS and GIS analysis. Uh, pretty much in uh, in all GIS analysis, especially in in sharing GIS data, it's best practice to consider uh, consider these attributes usually on an area-based normalization. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, your data features are not always the same size, and you usually do not want the size of your feature to be uh, a determining factor in whether or not you notice an area of a higher concentration or not. Um, considering the proportion of the target market, so essentially how much of the total population does that target market uh, represent, uh, that decision can be fueled by the, the actual goals of the analysis. You'll see in our, in our work later in this afternoon, we did not do normalization of any of our attributes by, by total population, but we did do it by uh, area. Um, normalization by population does allow you to see uh, population clustering, um, but it does also introduce issues of representing large absolute differences. So, for example, if an area has um, five of your target market and there are 10 total people in that area, that's one half versus one, one person in, two, in, a, in an area of two people. And so you could then mislead your, your, your analysis depending on the goal. And if you do normalize by both area and population, you don't get rid of that, that issue. So normalizing by population is a little bit trickier and, and, and needs to be more, more carefully considered. One other um, uh, basic of, of, or fundamental of ArcGIS is the overlay action. This is one of the most popular actions to do in analysis of, ge ge of uh, geographical information. So essentially what you want to do is you want to compare attributes from different data sets of possibly different geometries but in the same spot. And so one of the, one of the ways to do that is simply to overlay this information and then see what you get out. But as you can notice, this can cause some issues in terms of data quality. Um, you start generating very small areas that may not really have much physical meaning for your analysis but also in terms of the actual processing, and a lot of this stuff, especially when you're doing uh, statewide analyses, are very com computationally intensive, you start making all these small areas that then take up more space and require more computing power. And so you can very quickly um, essentially explode the number of, of features that you have in your data set. So overlay actions are powerful. They're very common. Um, but you do have to have that issue to take care of. And one of, the, one of the solutions that we pursued is essentially you can make a gridded representation of your data. And so instead of looking just at the value, looking at the data in its original geometry, you might uh, overlay a grid and do some kind of uh, aggregation within that grid. So you might average within the grid. You might sum within the grid, depending on whatever your um, whatever is appropriate for your analysis. And then you have consistent geometries that overlap, overlay each other, do not create new features, do not create new geometries, do not create small areas that have no physical, um, no physical meaning for your, for your analysis. Of course, when you do this, then you do lose resolution in terms of the actual physical shape of that geometry. So your grid resolution needs to be carefully considered. Um, you need to analyze the effect of your grid size essentially on your final results when, as you do this type of analysis. So, Mark, do we have any questions online yet? Um, we, we do not. I would ask people to raise their hands uh, if they have a question, then I can unmute them. Okay, so uh, in case you didn't hear that, if you do have a question, please use the uh, raise hand feature or just or type in the chat box. Um, but if raise hand feature would be preferred um, on the GoToWebinar. Are there any questions in the room at all? Okay. No. No questions. Yeah. Didn't expect it. So those are very basics of ArcGIS. But I just want to make sure that we had covered them so that everybody's on the same the same uh, level playing field going forward. Um, so what are the tools that we actually use in ArcGIS in, in our development of chips? So we did discuss overlay actions already, and that's a, that is in itself a built-in action, a built-in capability in ArcGIS. 
but some of the more sophisticated things that we utilize. One of them is the network analysis um, in order to determine something that's called a service area. So if you've ever used a mapping application like Google Maps to help you navigate, uh, you have used actually a network analysis. It works with data sets having geometry that represents the system of roadways and then attributes that, are, that represent traveling metrics like the speed on the travel speed on the roadway. Uh, you could actually have other features like volume of traffic on the roadway, et cetera. Uh, the representation of the roadway network that you have, keeping in mind that any data set is still just a model or representation of the real world, that representation, the quality of that representation has a significant impact on the quality and the validity of your final uh, network analyst solution. So uh, these figures down here, these are in the ArcGIS, um, and ArcGIS desktop work in a kind of environment. And there are a number of different types of network analyses that you can perform in ArcGIS. Um, as you work with them, they create new features, create new layers. And this is just one example of kind of a, you know, one of the one of these um, these analyses. But let's walk through a few of those just so you know what types of analyses are possible. So, for example, you can simply want to find the fastest route between two locations, like Google Maps, um, in maybe more real world or or everyday application. This is like wanting to find the fastest route from work to home uh, when there's heavy traffic in hydrogen stations. Maybe you're at the Harbor City Station and you want to go check out the Torrance Station. And so it tell you the fastest route and how long it's going to take to get there. You might want to find the closest facility to an origin. So you're at home hungry at night and you want to find the closest pizza restaurant. That's what's maybe in, in Google Maps um, in terms of hydrogen stations. You can actually use that to figure out from any location what is the nearest hydrogen station, what's going to be the likely uh, station that somebody might visit. You can optimize uh, entire routes of service. So, for example, a UPS delivery truck, and this actually is something that these delivery systems use, utilize a lot. You know, they, they have their truck. It can make so many stops during a day. It can carry so much volume of, of uh, material and then have to return to the depot and go back out. And you can optimize that entire set of, of parameters to find the best route, the best order of places to visit. So. Hydrogen stations, maybe the mobile refueler needs to visit all the stations in the Southern California region uh, on a given day and needs to stop at, at back at a home base every few stations. So what's the order of those stations that should be visited and, and how long is it going to take? And this is an optimized route. So this is the best for, uh, for tri taking into account traffic. Or, and this is the one that is actually um, utilized in our analyses uh, for CHIT, you can actually find the boundary of the area that can be reached from any starting point. So um, if you're visiting Napa and you're in downtown Napa, you want to find out how many wineries you can visit within 20 minutes of driving time. Or for these hydrogen stations, this is how far can, what is the extent of, say, a six-minute drive from that station, since we're all familiar with the six-minute drive um, uh, metric. This, this is how you find this. So the, essentially, ArcGIS can analyze every single route beginning from a station and find how far you can get within six minutes of driving time based on the attributes that you've stored in your, in your um, roadway network. Uh, in addition, there are a number of options that you can utilize to tailor these kinds of analyses. You can look at the elevations of the roads to in, in order to say, okay, this particular line in my data set is actually an overpass, and so if you're passing under it, you can't get onto the overpass, obviously, immediately from that from a line that's going underneath it. U-turn uh, capabilities, where are U-turns allowed? Where are they not allowed? Uh, curb approaches, can you only get to a certain location by approaching it from the left or the right side? And then delays encountered in making turns or uh, passing through intersections. It's important to, to keep in mind that the degree of detail for these types of tuning parameters is going to depend heavily on your data and computing resources, um, the extent of your network analysis, and the goals of the analysis. Essentially, the bigger the problem that you're trying to solve, if you're trying to solve an entire statewide problem, and you want to consider delays encountered at all the lights in the entire state, that is a massive amount of data, 
a massive amount of information that you have to have of a high quality, and it then takes a massive amount of computing time. So maybe that might not be the best, maybe that might not be a, a, an option that you are really able to pursue. So that is all for network analysis. Um, another major uh, uh, feature from ArcGIS that we utilized was uh, spatial analysis and looking at spatial distribution. So analysis of spatial data brings in, obviously, more dimensions beyond non-spatial data. Um, patterns that may not be apparent just looking at data in an Excel spreadsheet can become readily evident, readily evident when their spatial arrangement is considered. So um, spatial statistics is actually the study of this and how to identify patterns in spatial data and how to quantify uncertainty, quantify variation uh, in spatial data. And this is useful in whenever you need to do data interpolation. So as I mentioned earlier, your data, uh, your data sources can have varying degrees of resolution, varying degrees of quality. Sometimes you need to fill in gaps in data. So you need to be able to model that data, and that's required for interpolation, analysis, and identification of trends, patterns, and comparisons between data sets. So a quick example of this, I mean, if we're looking at a spreadsheet and we have these, this data, we're looking at it, um, we kind of see, okay, it just looks like a random arrangement of numbers one through four. Um, and, you know, it's just, and if we had try to perform some analysis on it, it's just, there's just four of each of them. It doesn't really mean much to us. But if we're actually working with data that's in, in geospatial reference, um, and we look at this, this is actually tied to some positions on a grid, then we can, and we plot it out, then we can see, oh, well, this actually is in important information. This, this data is, or are, this data are actually showing us a hot spot. They're showing us that there is some pattern when you actually take into account the geospatial distribution of this data. And so, um, the tools in ArcGIS are really there to help you be able to analyze that, help you be able to make sense of all of that. Um, ArcGIS provides tools not only to model the data, but also to simply just explore it and just, just look at the data quality you have, analyze the data you have, assess whether or not it's appropriate uh, for, your, for your analysis. One of the key concepts in this is uh, actually Tobler's first law of geography. Uh, which states that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Um, so similar to fundamental principles and a lot of your hard sciences and your engineering, that this is one of the, the fundamental principles of geography. And it actually makes its way into pretty much all of these tools here um, that you see on the right. So um, all of these spatial statistics tools that are, that are indicated on the slide on the right here, these are all built in. These are all things that you can actually utilize in ArcGIS. So Tobler's Law provides that conceptual framework for finding notable features in the distribution of attributes, like that hot spot example that I, I gave earlier. It's also directly related to many predominant methods of interpolation for GIS. So again, where you need to fill in data where there are spatial gaps. Um, and in particular, uh, the inverse distance weighted interpolation method. This is uh, one of the main and one of the most basic ways to model data or to fill in uh, information. Um, it, that function and its related functions directly assume Tobler's first law. They're essentially the mathematical um, manifestation of that law. But like many statistical modeling methods um, and many met modeling methods in general, you have to take care in defining the parameters because usually, especially with more complex statistical models, there's going to be more parameters and estimation methods and, and how you tune them, of course, can alter the solution. So again, as an example, we earlier saw this, this hot spot uh, geometry that from a few slides ago, but let's say, let's assume for the sake of argument that we didn't have that much information. Let's say we actually only had these four points from our data and we wanted to find out, well, based on these, this information, what should we expect the value should be right here in this, this highlighted cell? 
And so, uh, you know, in, in accordance with that inverse distance weighting in Tobler's first law, you might look out over a certain radius, you look at all the values that are within that radius, and you then, you then assign their, their uh, value to this central one based on a weighting uh, given from their distance to that, to that uh, central point that you're looking at. So let's say we, we, we're looking at it essentially at you know, three cells radius from that central, from that, that target, and we take these values from each of these cells, weight them by the distance uh, between the center of this cell, whoops, the, target, the center of the target cell, and the center of each of these cells, and we come up with some number, 0.76, right? But if we make just one change in that entire process and we look out at a slightly larger radius, we look out at four uh, cells away, right, and we then identify these are all the cells that might affect the value, then we'd actually come up with a different solution, and 0.7. Um, so this is, you know, this is a, an example in the weeds, but this can have an effect when you're actually doing these analyses. And you need to be able to, to, you know, look at your analysis, look at your interpolation, look at the assumptions you make, and look at the effect of them, and make sure that uh, it hasn't significantly altered what your expectation is or what your interpolation is of the data. So, are there any? There is one hand raised. Yeah. From a, uh, let me unmute it here. It's been raised for a little while from a uh, Sarush. Mo Mochelle, Michelle, are they on the line? Sarush, are you there? Your, your phone is unmuted. Nothing. Well, no response. Do okay. we have any, any questions in the room at all? Also, for the people online, you can also type in, uh, if you have a question, type it into your question box um, on the screen and we'll, we'll answer it at the appropriate uh, time period. Okay. All right, so I guess we'll move on then to uh, custom tools in ArcGIS. So everything I've discussed so far is actually capabilities built in to ArcGIS. They're fundamental in it. Uh, you can find all these easily available within ArcGIS, um, but sometimes you need to build a custom tool, um, and there might be many reasons for that. So one thing I want to first uh, discuss is that the term model is really a broad term. Um, it's used in many disciplines. It means many different things to many different people. Um, usually whenever somebody hears the word model, they have some idea in their head of what that means, um, and it's usually based on what they've experienced um, you know, in their professional careers. Et cetera, but really it's a, it's a broad term and it can mean a number of different things. It can be simply a single equation between an independent variable and a dependent variable. It could be a set of equations, it could be a statistical regression on a set of data, or it could be some intricate branching, iterating set of code, right, that models something in the real world or, or represents something in the real world. Um, ArcGIS provides what they call model builder and you then build models in model builder um, but for the implementation that we're going to be discussing today, uh, later on, especially in the afternoon, it's probably really more appropriate to think of Model Builder as a way to catalog and share your analysis process and to be able, in a consistent and repeatable manner, and to be able to also share the data that you utilize for that process and assumptions that you made along the way. So um, ArcGIS essentially allows, anal allows you as an analyst to combine their built-in ArcGIS tools and any other tools that you create along the way to perform tasks that are combinations of these tools. So this is kind of a simple example um, where these are all built-in ArcGIS tools um, from just from the program itself and you, you put these in the order of, essentially in the order of execution that you want to perform these, these tasks on some set of data. And then you can also actually incorporate a custom tool. This might be a tool, a separate tool that you made earlier on. And then ArcGIS has this. You can, you can actually save this as your own tool in your own toolbox and then share it. And you can send it to a coworker. You can send it to somebody else 
uh, in the industry, and they can then see the process that you that you actually implemented, and not only see that process, but if this is all written uh, appropriately, then you can act, they can actually run it and run it with their own data in in ArcGIS uh, desktop or in in some ArcGIS environment. So another benefit of this, and this was very important to us, especially given the aspect of wanting to create a tool that is open to the public and that will have stakeholder um, input and will be, uh, will be shared and, and utilized in our report. Um, it also allows for documentation of the process and the ability to consistently apply those key input values. So um, if, we'll discuss this in the afternoon, but we do intend that, uh, to make uh, actually chit the tools that we develop available along with the data sets that we utilize for our 2015 ABA report analysis. So um, if it does come to that time and, and you are actually interested and you download the, the, the tools and you open them up in ArcGIS and you look under the hood and want to see what's going on, um, you know, there, there are some things to be, to, to, to be aware of. Um, if you look at the models, essentially anything that has a P on it is a parameter. So that's something that as you run the model, you as a user can change that parameter and change an assumption essentially. Um, for example, uh, we made an assumption that there at, in one of our processes that we're, we want to analyze the capacity needed for 34,300 vehicles because that was our 2021 projection from our ABA report. But if a user wants to, has a different projection for how many vehicles they want to analyze, let's say they think it's 50,000, they can in that tool change that number. So that's just the, the user uh, input. And then um, when you actually will receive, when you do download shit, it will actually have all of the default values that we use. And those default values will be the values used in the AB8 2015 report. So you'll be able to see what our analysis was, was based on. So just from the original download, uh, you should be able to actually go through all the steps and recreate the exact analysis we generated and recreate the data that we generated um, in that process. And then you can uh, play with it as you like. Um, some things to, to, to be aware of and um, in case you're interested more in the, the, the inner workings of the modeling, a lot of times with these, with these types of tools, the analysis may require uh, some steps that need to be performed on every feature in a data set, or sometimes maybe even multiple data sets in a database, right? You just need to do the same steps over and over for multiple times. So that's, you need, you need iteration for that. Um, ArcGIS is a little bit um, more, uh, I guess, more strict on how you can implement iteration than other tools. So if you are uh, used to other modeling languages or modeling tools, um, it's a little bit more strict you can only have one iterator within any given tool. Um, so, and every single step in that tool other than the iterator will occur within that tool. So a lot of times what you'll see is that um, any steps that actually need to be iterated through will be separated out into their own custom tool and then they'll be utilized in another tool. They'll be integrated into it. So it's kind of like a nesting of that iterated tool. Um, and you'll actually see that in um, in the in the chip tool package um, when in our assessment of the coverage factor. So the coverage factor it requires iteration on a number of features, and that iteration is actually separated out into a different um, tool itself. And we will actually go over um, the separate tools later this afternoon and we'll indicate kind of what each of those different tools does and, and discuss a little bit more about, you know, the, the logic of those tools and, and what the, the process was. In addition, um, unlike other development languages or environments, ArcGIS doesn't necessarily initially assume that the structure of your process, as you see it on the screen, indicates the order of how things need to execute. Um, so if you do have processes that you actually need to um, you actually do need a certain step to occur before any, another step can happen. You do have to tell RTS to do that, and that's actually indicated if you do. Later on, look at all these models, these dashed lines. Um, that's what 
ArcGIS calls a precondition. So that indicates that everything over here has to happen before this step can occur. And in this particular example, everything over here is essentially sorting a data set. And I don't expect too many people, well, can't read that in those room anyways, but um, this, and then this particular calculation is based on essentially the order of the data after the sort. So in this example, we need to enforce this precondition because we need the data to be sorted in order for the calculation to be completed appropriately because it depends on the sorting order. And so are there, do we still have any questions? Uh, I'm looking here. No questions, although um, same person still raising their hand. From U.S. Hybrids. What was the name again? Sarish Mo Moshel. So, uh, Sarish, are you there? From U.S. Hybrids? No. If you're talking and we're not hearing you, maybe try typing your question into the chat box. He just raised his hand again. I don't know if you have questions here. Um, one thing is, I, I don't, I mean, I know you put this on the um, email, but we're not using VOIP. We use the call-in, so if they're... Oh, yeah, if, it, yeah, um, Mark just pointed out, if you're on VOIP, we may not be able to hear you. Um, you might want to call in with the, call in on a phone with the phone line number that's displayed on, um, in, in the uh, go to webinar box. All right. So for now, we're going to go ahead and continue. Um, I believe this is the last uh, section for this morning, so we're definitely ahead of schedule. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll discuss a little bit more then about the actual data sets now. So everything prior was very, you know, kind of just conceptual. Um, some of the, the basic fundamental ideas that uh, we want to cover, but this is a little bit more about the actual data that we utilize. So, we utilize two main sets of data, census data and uh, California DMV data. The census data that we utilize can actually all be found at the American Fact Finder, so factfinder.census.gov. Um, FactFinder is actually kind of a clearinghouse for multiple different data sets um, for essentially every data collection program that the Census Bureau runs and that they operate. Um, you can get very detailed data on, very, on a number of different topics, uh, but essentially they, they do provide a tool to help you and guide you towards selecting your data set based on the geographic scale that you're interested in, the types of attributes that you're, that you're interested in, and even the statistical certainty. Um, getting into the statistical certainty requires reading up a little bit about the particular study or the particular data source that you might be looking at, but uh, that's all actually available on their website um, and it's documented. They have really long reports about how they, they uh, obtain the data and then how they actually, what math they do to it before it gets to the final product that they, they provide. Uh, we utilize the American Community Survey. Um, we utilize that because that's the program that it's every year it's continually updated um, and it has a lot of information. It, it, it's a survey that asks a lot of questions, a lot of pretty detailed questions, and so there, was, there are a lot of attributes in that data set that we felt we could utilize in this analysis. So ACS data are actually available on a variety of geographic scales, um, and choosing the right scale depends on what you really want to do. So for example, the, the smallest scale is a block, and that's actually point data. And that's the fundamental unit from the actual survey itself that goes out. And then that's the data, the only data source for which they provide the raw 100% data count. It's not just a representative sample. In the ACS data set, any larger uh, geography is actually kind of a statistical modeling of the data that they've collected and it, it's estimates based on a representative set. Block groups are the smallest geography for which 
you can get that then that sample data. Um, and those are then represented as polygons. You can then get a track. So census tracts are, you know, uh, common to a lot of people. Uh, roughly equivalent to a neighborhood. Uh, they largely stay constant throughout time, but they can change uh, depending on how population densities shift. And those are also represented as polygons. And then you have counties, states, and then there are some other uh, different types of geographies that are also interesting. County subdivisions, regions, urbanized areas. So essentially how the Census Bureau views maybe our, our mental uh, depiction of a, of a full uh, city metropolitan area, right? So what is the full LA metropolitan area? What is Atlanta's full uh, metropolitan area? Um, and then legislative districts, et cetera. So looking at three of these, um, that we considered and, and worked with in, the, in our work. Uh, blocks, there are about 410,000 of them in California. Um, while it is high resolution in terms of the number of features that you get and the geometry of it, uh, it doesn't have a lot of actual attributes. So the data for the attributes are limited. You can't, for example, as, as I said before, these blocks are, these are the actual 100% data. So you don't get essentially like the mean at that point. It is just is like the count of people at that point. Um, we utilize that then in our analyses mostly for population. Uh, block groups, there's about 23,000 of them, typically contain between 600 and 3,000 people. Um, the income data is available in aggregate sum only. So you either get a total count or a median. And we'll talk this afternoon about why income data and other attributes were important. And just to give you a sense, the average size of one of these is about seven square miles, but there is actually a, a pretty big uh, range of sizes for uh, block groups. Uh, census tracts then are the largest uh, geometry we looked at, about 8,000 of them. Uh, there's typically 1,200 to 8,000 people in each of them. The Census uh, Bureau mentions that for their statistical analyses, they try to optimize it towards 4,000. So they, apparently that's the kind of a magic number for their, their analyses, and so that's what they typically try to aim for in a, in a track. Um, income data is available at track level in a number of forms, though, and so in terms of doing interpolation, in terms of doing other modeling with the data, track level data is actually very rich in information to be able to, to accomplish that. So you get, you get aggregate sums, you get medians and means, you get cutoffs of different percentiles, um, so you get shares within different percentiles um, and all the way up to the top 5% of, of, for any attribute. And that average area is about 20 square miles. So counts that like you get from block data, um, they're useful because they're, you, can directly, you can directly implement them you, when, and if you can directly implement them actually. So um, you don't they're useful when you want to avoid too much data transformation and you want to avoid too much of your own interpolation and, and the possibility of introducing error. But using aggregate counts alone doesn't let you do certain things. You can't then really interpolate um, across different areas if you have aggregate counts alone for many of these attributes. So for example, the mean of an income alone cannot help you determine what's the cutoff for the 20%, top 20% without significant additional assumptions. So if you want to do that type of analysis, you need something, you need more information. So then you need something like a block group or a track. Um, and that comes from these descriptive statistic attributes beyond the count. And that's what really allows for statistical modeling, interpolation, and extrapolation if, when necessary. So we'll see some of this in the afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm not going too much into depth and detail right now on this idea, but it, we essentially did need to do interpolation, and that led our our um, our choices of utilizing census tracts uh, over block groups for, for pretty much all our data. So the other data source we utilized was DMV data. So we looked at uh, information based on registrations of vehicles. Um, for tools and data that can remain confidential, actually there is we do have access to uh, information on the all the way down to the actual address level, but again, this is a tool we wanted to uh, be able to share with the public and be able to discuss openly. And so we did not use 
that level of resolution of data. Um, publicly available data, data we can share, is available at the zip code level. And just a note about zip codes. Um, uh, pretty much off, pretty often we tend to think of zip codes as polygons. We tend to think of them as areas. Um, but in actuality, they are not. Um, zip codes are actually the set of routes that the Postal Service uh, you know, can actually, or it's a collection of a set of routes that the Postal Service serves. Um, and defining what that polygon is that bounds the extent of all those routes, that's actually a non-trivial uh, problem. <laughs> and uh, lucky for us, though, um, for a number of years, Everybody had their own way of doing it, but lucky for us now, the U.S. Census has developed a standard set of zip codes. So this is just an example on the right from San Francisco that, you know, all those streets in blue, those are certain zip codes. And that they came out of that particular section in San Francisco. And then on the bottom uh, figure there, you can see the, the, the lines that define the zip code tabulation areas. So, um, We've adopted the use of those in our work. Um, strictly speaking, they may not be 100% correct, but they are probably 99% correct <laughs> in terms of where, um, when you assign, what, what, what the geographic extents are of a, of a zip code. So uh, there are 1,800 zip codes available in the DMV data that we looked at. Um, and the ZCTAs are usually larger than tracks, um, but they can actually be similar in size in these urban areas where you have higher population density, and that kind of makes sense. You know, you have higher population density, and, you know, uh, one truck can only go service a smaller amount of area than, than when you have less population density. So, and some notes on choosing the right data source or choosing the right geography. Um, so, in our work, we chose blocks for population because that was the highest resolution available. Um, and with population, we didn't really do any data interpolation. We didn't do any data modeling. So we went ahead and used that. Um, for income, we used track um, because we needed to do some investigation of modeling the distribution of income. And also, um, we used, since we were using that for those kinds of attributes, we used that also for education. Um, BMB data. Uh, the resolution with zip codes that's represented by those ZCTAs. Um, so, um, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. And then um, we actually, from chat, as you remember at the beginning of the, this uh, presentation, we, on the OEM surveys, have a county and statewide resolution. And just keep in mind, the larger you go, the more statistical certainty you have because you have a bigger sample size. Remember that for, for block groups and tracks, the data that you get from the census is actually a statistical model. So it's, a, it's actually a, um, it's a sample set from the, from, the, from the total sum. So you get greater statistical certainty because you have a bigger sample, but then of course you have lower geographical resolution. So you have to balance that. Um, similarly, um, uh, ACS also actually provides data in one year of just one-year values, three-year aggregates, and five-year aggregates. So similar to using a bigger spatial area, using more data over a longer time gets you, again, a bigger sample size, a greater statistical certainty, but it may be less current. Um, aggregating years essentially allows for more samples, increases that certainty, um, and for similar reasons, uh, aggregated data is on increasingly large geometries when you use fewer numbers of years, right, because you're, you're in order to keep uh, a, a good statistical quality. In our analysis, we prioritize certainty and accuracy over currency. So we actually use uh, five-year aggregates in order to be able to do our analysis. And so actually, that is it for the morning session. We're way ahead of schedule. But um, essentially, the my hope we achieved here was to kind of give a sense of some of the, the fundamental features of doing this type of analysis and some of the fundamental issues that went into doing the modeling, uh, working with these data sources, what these, how these data sources are represented, what they contain, and how, how we actually you know, um, utilize those sources, how we analyze them, how we transform them and combine them. So 
Do we have any? We uh, have a hand raised from a Patrick Couch with Gladstein Associates. Patrick, Hi, Patrick. <laughs> are you there? I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, Andrew. Um, so I was interested in your approach of using uh, the zip code tabulation areas. Uh, in the past, when we've looked at census or uh, zip code data, uh, zip codes can be represented by multiple disjointed polygons um, spread over fairly large regions. Um, and there are obviously many parts of the state that simply don't have um, zip codes assigned to them because their population densities are too low. How do you guys uh, sort of fill in those gaps and, and standardize things? Does the ZT, ZCTA definition do that sufficiently for you? Um, or did you do something else? Yeah, um, so one of the things that we, yeah, we, we definitely saw during our analysis that the ZCTA definition, um, it does have gaps in the geometry, but the data that we had, uh, at least on the registrations, was we felt sufficiently represented by the geometries that were available from the ZCTA. Does that make sense? Like uh, we, didn't, we didn't necessarily have zip codes in our DMV registration data for which there was not a ZCTA geometry available, right? And did you find uh, geometries that were uh, sort of multi-part polygons? And, and if so, how did you decide which polygon to assign those to? Was that uh, geocoding and, and sort of matching within a particular polygon? We, hmm, I did not notice that in the data. Um, I can go back and look at that. Um, but the way that we actually would have would have assigned that, and then with the normalization by area, it should have essentially we would have essentially um, assigned it equivalently. Well, not equivalently to each area, but equivalently based on each of those uh, multi-part polygon relative areas. Then. Okay, got it. Thank you. We also uh, have a hand raised from a James Provenzano. Are you there, James? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, uh, so one of my questions was answered by the previous um, question and answer. Um, with the DMV data, what specifically within their database did you apply to the chip? Uh, are you looking at uh, vehicle values, and uh, do you do you link that with uh, with OEM data on purchasing uh, patterns within within um, within the polygons that you're using? So uh, we'll discuss that more in the afternoon. Um, but I uh, just kind of quickly overview: we utilize registrations of uh, green vehicles. We utilize we looked at. Um, the reported MSRP ranges from registered vehicles, um, and and we looked at registrations of luxury brands, luxury vehicle brands. Did you look at number of vehicles uh, per capita per per household? We did not look at that at that as an individual parameter. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other uh, hands raised? Uh, I'm taking a look. I don't see any. Or in the room? Any questions? So, Brendan? Um, so, you said you're going to release the uh, zip code level DMV registration data. Mm -hmm. How does IHS Automotive feel about that? Want to repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was that uh, we were looking we're looking to release our our input data, and the question was how does uh, Polk essentially feel about that? Um, the data that we utilize is it's publicly right. available. Right. 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 Yeah. It's not. If we have. We do not. We have not used any confidential data. Right. So. That would be interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't understand the background. 
Who's Polk? Oh. So Polk releases data on, well, I don't know if somebody, Gerard, do you want to answer a question? Or more? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gerard Ockblick also with ARB and then Polk is basically uh, is a company that provides uh, some very does some very detailed analysis of uh, legal registrations and can give some very uh, specific uh, uh, manufacturer specific and very uh, does a very in depth analysis. So the uh, and uh, so you could make assessments on what um, what manufacturer has what market share and what locations, and then Polk would help you assess that. But the information, I, I, I don't think we're providing information like that. So no. uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. one of the one of the differences is Polk typically gives very yeah. so that's why the comments. well, but gives very detailed information. Uh, yeah. We are, I mean, the data we would have is just an aggregate number, right? Uh, you would see like yeah. HEVs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not. It's not. There are this many HEVs on this street, or you know, of this. It's not this model and that that model year. It's just the aggregate count. Yeah. So. And, and Polk obviously uh, charges for the services, and and so you know, are we creating a conflict? And right. Yeah. I think it'd be Releasing difficult it. to do. Uh, I mean, the information we provide is is um, is intended to allow you to place. Uh, a station where you think the purchaser of a fuel cell vehicle will be, but it, it's not going to allow you to assess if they would buy a Hyundai or or, or a Daimler, and those are different different markets. I mean, so, it's, you know. it's the same. The nature of the data that we have is would be the same as the, the data that we already released in our ABA report, yeah, yeah. where we have the counts of fuel cell vehicle registration. Yeah. So right now we still we still have to pay to get even HEV counts. For mm. So what you're doing is um, it looks like Patrick uh, raised his hand. Patrick Couch. Yes. Yeah. Do you have well, another? Look here, Lakeith. Andrew, maybe you said it. Maybe you Hold didn't. On, Patrick. Um, but everything is based on where people live and what their earning capacity and their what they can purchase. Does it show the the routings on where they're traveling to every day? So that. yeah, so we'll discuss that in the afternoon. Okay. Um, that is a fundamental, essentially fundamental principle of how we did our analysis. That we we did adopt the you know the the, the assumption that we're looking at trying to place stations near the first adopter's home. Um, we'll discuss reasons why we went that route and other data that we looked at for trying to do other kinds of um, other kinds of analyses like you're talking about with routes and all that, but we'll we'll discuss it this afternoon. And Will we see that it's the same information that was used back at the workshop in August, or yes, it's, has so it modified all, at all since comments from that meeting? We have we have not modified the the, the tool yet. Um, yeah, good. Okay, <laughs> looking forward to it. Uh, Patrick, do you have another question? I do, I do. Uh, so. One of the challenges that we've encountered with uh, registration data, and I'm curious if you've seen it in your data sets, is that registration data really reflects the registration address. And while that's probably yeah. sufficient for uh, you know, the, the individual uh, sort of consumer owner, uh, when commercial fleets are involved, oftentimes you'll see several thousand vehicles registered at a single address, and it's, it's clear that that's not where they actually are domiciled. Um, did you guys encounter that, um, try to deal with that in any way, or are you focused essentially on non-commercial and hence it's not an issue? Yeah, yeah, we're aware of that issue, and we even see that with sometimes with, um, the, the numbers we report in the AB8 report. But um, yeah, we, we are focused on the residential market for this analysis. Um, it, it's definitely a topic of discussion um, within our agency and across other agencies as far as you know looking at how to how to marry the the commercial retail individual customer market possibly with commercial markets um, but that's an ongoing discussion and so for this analysis we we're focusing on that that retail customer that individual owner thank you yep 
Okay, it it appears it appears that um, James raised his hand again. Uh, James, are you there? Do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. A, a quick one. Um, well, regarding the non the non residential markets, you know, you've got you know DOD and you've got uh, federal executive orders to get these vehicles out there. So that that could be something that could be looked at. Um, you know, it might be small areas areas uh, applied, but large large potential in those areas related to fleets and so forth. That's more of a comment. But the um, on the modeling, I, I see that there's a, there, the raw data going in, into uh, Chet. Is there? Did you use any other data from models um, like models, like maybe from the OEM uh, sector or from other retail models and applied that to CHIT? Was there any overlay of, of, of existing models? When you say model, you mean, okay, so other tools to, to model this, this work? This or, or, or data, you know, the, the data coming out of different models. Um, no, we did not. Um, we do not have access to OEM uh, models or OEM uh, specific data uh, other than the survey that we send out every year into, uh, for our ABA program and the report that we, that we uh, uh, produce every June. Um, we, we are obviously we're aware of, of the different models that are, that are out there. We, um, you know, we, we have discussions with other modelers um, on a pretty regular basis. Um, but we did not, uh, I guess, directly take any of their data and put it into this tool. Okay. Yeah, I was just I, I was just thinking about you know the, the climate models and and the and the comparative analysis um, among the different models and that that's very telling in itself if you've done some similar analysis. Uh, to, yeah. Yeah, that, that that could be an interesting um, yeah. definitely interesting thing to look at. And actually, um, uh, to get to actually now I'm forgetting what was what was your your earlier your first comment again? I <laughs> wanted to address that too. Oh, 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 just just the potential of, of even though it might be uh, a small area geographically, it could be a large opportunity for larger fleets. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it, 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 touching upon the commercial side of things, or, or the or the, uh, the the governmental, uh, you know, you know, DOD fleets and that type of thing. Right. And and in and just as a, a, a fundamental matter, I like, do not disagree that definitely there's more information out there than we could have than we even put into this model and this tool. And there's more information, especially on smaller geographies um, and, and in t highly targeted areas that could actually provide more information or provide a more nuanced analysis. However, and we'll, we'll talk about this this afternoon, the goal of this was really to provide an analysis, kind of a, a, a baseline analysis across the entire state and something you could implement across the entire state. And that, that does, and you know, that, that does kind of um, fuel some of the decisions you make in the data that you include and, and what you can and cannot consider. Um, so definitely see the value, like you're saying, in, in, in those. But um, yeah, that, that, that's part of the reason why we did not have that, that kind of consideration. Akasha? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Akasha Korkholz. I'm from the California Energy Commission. Earlier you were talking about um, increasing the size gives you greater statistical certainty but lower resolution. So is, is the resolution, how does the resolution compare to this idea of a six minute travel that we had several years ago in the CEC pond? So, so that's the resolution for, um, that was mainly in the context of the census data, so that's more on the demographic data and the information on the market, or the information we utilize to try to determine the market. The uh, drive time is, is based on, we'll again get to this in the afternoon, but it's based on um, uh, different, completely different type of data set. Um, that resolution is very fine, um, and then we did do some interpolation on that data set, and our interpolation on that data set was actually at a quarter mile resolution. So it's very it's much smaller than that six minutes. Well, typically the six minute drive time. Some areas of LA maybe it's not, but <laughs> um, it's in essence, you know, it's, it's a much smaller uh, resolution. Yeah, that 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 comment on the larger geographies, um, 
was very specific to the census data. It's, it's when you're choosing between block groups or tracts and even bigger geometry, you know, it, since it is a, a representative set that they're giving you information about, you are, it's with a bigger geography, you're including more people, so you have a bigger sample. But then, of course, your, geo, you know, your physical resolution is smaller. Or, I mean, it's, it's, your physical resolution is much coarser, right? So. Yeah, Brendan. So uh, back to the DMV data. Yeah. Uh, can anybody just go to the DMV and uh, hmm. get those kind of d data, or is it, is it because you're an agency? So we can get the data because we're an agency, but also if we aggregate the data, we are able to share, share what it. we have. Okay. To, do you yeah. know what uh, Polk does? Like, I do not know what Polk okay. generally does. Right. Yeah, I'm not just curious. sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if they have agreements. Yeah, yeah. No, but we do. Oh, we do. Yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah. Have, we also have confidentiality agreements. I mean, that's another. Right. Not just because right. we're a state agency, but because we agree. To right. Confidential. Right. Hypothetically, if you had a confidentiality agreement with the DMV, you could access those data. Right. We have. We have. No. We hypothetically have. I mean, as an agency with a confidentiality agreement, have access to street address <laughs> registration. Everything. Right, but we actually can't keep that either. We're part of the confidentiality agreement. So, um, utilizing zip code aggregated data allows us to keep data and be able to report on it. So. Uh, there's no more um, hands raised on the webinar. Any final questions in the room then, or? One thing, we're going to have to log off this webinar and then restart it, so we may want to mention that. Yeah, um, for everybody on the webinar, um, we're probably going to end early, a little bit early, and then take a lunch break. Um, we are actually going to close the webinar and start it back up. So when you come back after the hour and change break, um, we're going to start uh, try to start right at one. Um, you'll have to relaunch the uh, webinar, uh, uh, the webinar application. So just so, just so you know. And if there are no final questions, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the morning session. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>